Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. Today I'm bringing you guys a story time video and it is a difficult video for me to film. It's a difficult topic for me to talk about because there are a lot of people who know me really well who actually don't know anything about this. This is not something I've shared with a lot of people but I felt like it was something that I really wanted to talk about now because I think that there are some people out there who might be going through a situation like this and I really want to maybe be an inspiration and I want to let people know that there is going to be a light at the end of the tunnel and things will change and you know we all go through really horrible situations but we get over them and sometimes we're a lot better off and a lot stronger for them. So as you can tell by the title I'm going to talk about getting fired from my job in England. But before I get into the meat of the subject I want to apologize to you guys. I don't know if I look crazy right now. I have no idea. You may have noticed that my video quality kind of goes up and down and I explained in my coming clean video that I'm having problems filming in Trinidad and I have two major problems really. What I'm having issues with is number one, background noise. I have background noise in the day, I have background noise at night and also I'm having problems with lighting. And so when I film at night, basically I'm lighting myself with a desk lamp which generally gives me a shadow like hair and it makes me look crazy. It makes my makeup look really cakey and horrible because it's just terrible lighting. And then when I'm filming in the day, because my window is on this side, I get lit only from that one side and this side of my face is in shadow. Right now I'm filming at night, so if my makeup looks crazy or if there's a shadow, I think tonight the shadow is somewhere like hair or something. If there's a shadow, forgive me. This is, this is the struggle. This is what I'm dealing with. But anyway, let's get into the video. So for you to understand exactly what happened, I have to go back to when I first left Trinidad. And I first left Trinidad when I was 18. I went to study in Europe and I initially went to France. I studied in France for, well, I lived in France for five years in total. And when I left Trinidad, I had a scholarship from the government, which is a merit-based scholarship. And my scholarship was for three years. So I was in France at first and then I went to England to complete my studies. So by the time I went to England my scholarship was done and my situation was very different. And I was in London studying and it was extremely expensive. So I had really next to no money. It was a very hard time for me. I struggled. I was extremely broke. So I, f I completed my studies while I was there and the way that my scholarship worked, basically you had to sign a contract and it was either you came back to Trinidad and worked for the government or you repaid your scholarship. It might seem like it's a really good deal because if you come back to Trinidad obviously it means you have a job. You don't even really have to look for a job. The government will place you somewhere. But it really wasn't what I wanted mainly because I studied interpreting and there is no ministry of interpreting or anything like that. So I knew that if I came back and I worked for the government I would not be working in my field and it would be a commitment of at least three years where I would be doing something that was entirely different from what I studied. So I thought about it and I told myself, well, the best idea might be for me to work in England because that way I would be making a significantly higher salary than what I would make in Trinidad and repay my scholarship and so I wouldn't be committed for three whole years to a job that I didn't necessarily like or that wasn't suited to my qualifications. So when I finished my studies in London, I started looking for a job. It was difficult finding a job and while I was looking for a job, obviously, like I said, years before my scholarship had finished and I really had very little money. London is a very expensive place to live and I struggled. I struggled. Eventually, I got an interview and I was offered a position with a company in London. And I was so excited because the salary was decent and because it was such an interesting company as well. I don't know if you guys have heard of this kind of thing, but basically what it is is that people can pay sort of like a subscription or a membership fee and then they call us at this company. I'm saying us as though I work there, right? Well, anyway, so they call this company and basically the company acts as like a virtual concierge. So when you call, you can call with any kind of problem and your virtual concierge will solve your problem for you. So I thought it was such an interesting idea. I thought it would be so much fun. It would, you know, it was really, at the time, it was the answer to my prayers. And I thought I would enjoy doing it for however long I did it. 
And there's also the fact that I have to mention that when you study and you complete, at least at that time, I think it's probably changed now, but when you complete a master's degree in England at the time, you were allowed to do a sort of uh, work experience or have a job and, you know, continue to work in the UK. And I got to the stage where I actually called the government in Trinidad and I was like, look, I've decided I'm going to repay my scholarship. It was hundreds of thousands of TT dollars, but, you know, I was like, I will be able to do this. I worked out a deal with them. I was like, I'm not going to be working for the government. I will repay my scholarship so I can do a job in my field. And I started my job at this company. And I don't think I want to name the company. I don't think I want to be too specific about what exactly, because I don't want to have like a lawsuit or anything to deal with. This is real life. Basically, it's a concierge company. And I think that's all I really need to say. The first week of the job was a week of training. And that was really good. It went well. It was interesting. I mean, I just love the concept of being able to be that person that anyone could call and I would find a solution to their problem. So yeah, the training went well and we started work the following week. And each of us had a mentor who was kind of assigned to us who would guide us through the process of how all of the different systems work and help us apply all of the things that we learned in our training. And my mentor was a girl, I cannot remember her name, it was like one of those short cutesy names like Poppy or Chloe or I don't know, something like that. I think I asked someone, you know, how come she was selected to be a mentor for one of the new recruits. And I was told it was because she was the best manager and they called us managers. And they said that it was because she was the best manager in the business. Now, obviously, I'm super ambitious and I'm like, well, how do I become the best? You know, so I was like, what do you mean she's the best? How do we gauge who is the best in the business and how things work in this company? I mean, I'm really sorry. This is going to be a kind of a long video. But anyway, the way things worked in this company was that customers would rarely ever compliment us or we, we didn't call them customers. We call them members. So the members would never really compliment us because obviously when they call this service that they're paying for, that's supposed to fix all their problems. When their problems get fixed, that's entirely what they expect. And so they don't feel like there's a need to be like, oh, you did such a great job. But what would happen is that they would complain if ever they weren't satisfied with something. So what I was told was that this girl, Zoe, Chloe, Poppy, whatever, she was the best uh, manager in the business because she had never had a complaint filed against her in the entire time that she worked there. So I was like, great, you know, I'm learning from the best and I'm going to be amazing at this job and I'm going to really enjoy it, even though it's not entirely what I trained for. It's something that I can enjoy while I repay my scholarship and don't find myself stuck in some dead end public service job. So yeah, she was really nice to me. We sat in these tiny little cubicles kind of right next to each other, pretty much on top of each other. In fact, it wasn't really like a cubicle that had any separation. So she was literally right next to me. Every time I had a question, I would turn to her. She would help me out and everything was going really well. You know, it just seemed like the, such an awesome place to work, such an interesting business concept. It was something that I was really excited about and I thought I could become quite passionate about. So we were working in different shifts and my second week on the job, I think I, I can't remember exactly, but my shift started at something like 7 a.m., or it might have been even earlier than that. But anyway, remember what I said about really being broke while I was in England. And it had come down to the point right before I got this job where I barely had anything to eat. I couldn't afford to shop at Tesco's or anything like that. I would be going to markets, picking out all of the bad fruit and all of those things that would be sold really cheaply. I got to the stage where I couldn't even take the tube anymore. It was too expensive for me. I still had my student Oyster card. And what I would do is I would go everywhere by bus, even though where I lived wasn't necessarily close to anything. It wasn't really central London. It was northeast London, kind of. There was no tube station nearby. And to get to central London by bus, it would take you easily an hour, if not more. Here I am in this situation. I don't have a lot of money, but I have to be getting to and from this job every day. I can't even afford to buy myself lunch every day. You know, my situation was really, money was tight. 
And of course, although I had this new job and I was really excited about it, I was only three weeks in, so I hadn't received a penny from them yet. So I was still in the same situation that I was in before I got the job, if not a worse situation. And now I had this debt. I had to repay my scholarship. When I had that shift that was starting at, it might have been 7 a.m., I think it was, um, that would have meant me waking up at about 4.30 in order to get to that job on time because I was relying only on buses. And I think at the, around that time, there's not really many buses running. So yeah, so it, it was gonna be rough. So I think I did it on the first day. I woke up on Monday morning at 4 a.m., 4.30 a.m. and I went into work and everything. And I was just exhausted afterwards. And at some point towards the end of the day, I get a phone call from one of our members and they're calling in with a complaint. I think I'd been doing pretty well at the job up until then. In fact, the week before I had had a positive feedback, which like I said, is really rare. The members rarely ever gave us positive feedback, but here is this person calling in with a complaint. To me, it's not really a serious issue or anything like that, but it is a member calling with a complaint. And I think, you know, we have to treat this with some degree of importance you know so but I don't know what to do because it's the first time I've ever had to deal with someone calling in with a complaint so obviously what do I do I turn to my mentor who is sitting right here next to me I look at her and I ask her like Chloe Zoe Poppy whatever her name was I was like what do I do because someone has just made a complaint and she says to me normally if someone makes a complaint you have to flag it but show me what it is so I showed her what the person was complaining about and everything. And then she looks at it and she was like, wow, this is a job that I did. And I was like, oh, well, what should I do? Should I, should I still flag it? Like what to do? And she's like, well, yeah, I guess you have to flag it. But I didn't even know how to flag a complaint because I don't think they covered that in training. So I was like, well, how do I flag it? What, like, what am I supposed to do? So she walks me through the process of flagging this complaint, which was a complaint against her. So yeah, that was kind of awkward. I mean, she showed me how to do it and everything. And I think both of us were kind of in the position where it was like, what do, how, this is weird, but what do we do? So anyway, so I was the one who flagged the first ever negative feedback that she ever got. So yeah, so that had happened. And so that Monday night, what I did was I stayed over at a friend's house who lived in central London. So yeah, we were going to just have dinner and everything and then I was going to spend the night at his and I was going to go to work from there the following day. I would be able to like get much more sleep and I would be able to get to work on time without all the hassle of taking a million buses to get from where I lived to where this job was. For whatever personal reasons he had, he didn't drink. He really did not have even the tiniest sip of alcohol ever. That was just his lifestyle, you know? So we had dinner at his and we prepared something. I think I must have prepared it. I can't really remember right now, but I know that I purchased a small bottle of wine, not a normal size bottle. The size that you get on an airplane, that's the type of bottle of wine that I bought. And that was because I knew that for dinner that night, I would be the only one having any and he wouldn't. So I purchased that really small bottle and you know we had dinner whatever normal and then the next day I took the bus because even though I'm still in central London still can't afford the tube so I took the bus um, into work and I got to work super early and I was really pleased with myself and I'd had a decent amount of sleep and you know all was good this would be Tuesday of my third week so anyway this Tuesday I come in for my early shift and you know everything is normal and there was one of the, the managers, like one of our superiors actually, who I was getting pretty friendly with and we would talk and everything. And, you know, he told me, oh, his mom was from Jamaica and all of these things or whatever. And everything went well. That was the Tuesday. On Wednesday, I come into work and I think it was just before lunchtime, I am called in to a meeting by my superiors. And so there is about maybe three or four guys sitting in this room 
and they want to talk to me and I'm like I have no idea what they want to talk to me about I was completely you know I had no clue what it was. I didn't know if they were taking all the new employees in one by one and discussing their first week and their performance I had no idea what it was so imagine my surprise when they tell me that they had a report that I came into work intoxicated the day before and that I was smelling of alcohol, behaving as though I was drunk, and that there was a bottle of wine in my handbag. I cannot begin to tell you, I cannot begin to put into words how completely stunned I was because it was just so false. It was the last thing that I expected them to be saying. I can't begin to explain to you what that feeling was when they came and they made these crazy accusations. When I think back about it, I think like right on the heels of my just complete utter shock and surprise was anger because I started to think to myself, who would say these things? I started, I was angry, I was confused. I was like, are they making this up? Are they trying to test me to see how I would react or whatever? But it was that thing that they said about a bottle of wine being in my handbag that gave me pause because there had been a, a wine bottle in my handbag the day before. But remember what I said, Monday night I had gone to my friend's house, I had bought a small bottle, a miniature sized bottle of wine just for myself because I knew he wouldn't be having any and, um, and that was that. And it was, like I said, a really small bottle and it was in my handbag and it was empty. It was empty in my handbag. It was empty before I ever got to work on Tuesday, obviously, because I'd had it at dinner the night before. So I don't know if that seems like a crazy excuse. Maybe it's not believable to you and I probably wasn't believable to them. But the reason that it was in my handbag was because, number one, I wasn't sure where he recycled his glass items and so I didn't really know where to put it when it once it was empty and then number two I actually like those bottles a lot and it seems stupid and crazy I know there's only one way for me to prove it to you so I'll show you I'm just gonna reach right here onto my windowsill so you so you can see that I actually have this which is like the same size as the one that was in my handbag that was empty I keep them, I like them, they're cute, I collect them, they're terrible decorations, but I don't know, something about them is cute to me, like small versions of bigger things, I don't know, I, I think it's a normal human thing to find that cute, so I mean, you could look at this, I don't know with this crazy lighting that I have, if you can even see that there is dust on this pot, this has been sitting on my windowsill for a long time. You know, this is just a bottle that's been empty a long time, and I can't bring myself to throw it away because it's adorable. I have another one. I have this, which had some kind of sparkling wine in it, kava or something, that I got as a Christmas present years ago, like when I was still studying in England, I got this as a Christmas present. I still have the bottle, right? This means this bottle traveled to Trinidad with me, right? And what is it? Empty, right? I have this cute little one as well, right? And, you know... I just like these things. I collect these things. It doesn't mean anything. They're not full of alcohol. I'm not like, I'm not a drunk. And if, and anybody who knows me knows that. I feel like I haven't really talked about this. You know, I haven't talked to people who I work with or anything, but those who know me in a professional capacity will know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I do not come to work drunk. I am not a drunk. I do not have a drinking problem. And it was just, it was crazy to me. I mean, I guess I could see because these people are coming from a different context and a different culture. And I know that in England there is this kind of tendency for young people to binge drink and they go out and they drink alcohol to get drunk. And maybe another person that same age, I think I must have been 23 at the time or 24, I think I was 23. Anyway, I, I know another person that age in England might be going to dinner with a friend knowing that they'll be the only one drinking and still buy a whole big bottle of wine and have it all to themselves, you know what I mean? Because it's a different culture. That is not really the culture of where I am from. And also remember, I had just come from living in France for five years. 
So having a little bit of wine, a glass or maybe two at dinner with a friend is not a big deal. And it's certainly not something that you do to get drunk and get wasted and be throwing up, you know, in a gutter somewhere. That is not really what it's about. Wine is something that is um, cultural and it's something that, that is cultivated and it's something that it's not a big deal. So the only reason I still had the bottle was, like I said, because first of all, I wasn't too sure where to throw it away. And I decided not to bother searching too hard because it was a cute little bottle and I was going to keep it. And it was in my handbag the following day because I had not gone home. Obviously, I went straight from his place to work. So I knew that that bit of the story that they told, the crazy accusation, that was true. There was a bottle, but that bottle was empty. It had been empty when I came into work. And it's not because I had it on the bus on the way to work or anything. And to be like, if we're being real right now, I showed you the size of that little bottle. What is like, who drinks that and gets drunk? Drunk enough to be in work, even if I had had it that morning, right before going into work. Who drinks that and is drunk so much so that they smell of alcohol and are acting drunk? Because these were the other two ac accusations. Number one, I had a bottle of wine in my bag. Number two, I was smelling of alcohol. And number three, I was acting like I was intoxicated. I was so baffled. So I explained to them, I was like, there was a bottle in my bag, it was an empty bottle. And it has nothing to do with me having anything to drink on the job or whatever. I feel like I can have whatever I want to have in my handbag. That's private. That's nobody's business. And it's no indication of what I'm doing on the job. And here is where I'm like, I'm starting to get angry. And also, at the same time, I'm really confused because I'm like, could someone have really believed that I was acting intoxicated? Is it that maybe my personality is too quirky and they think that nobody could be like that and be sober? Or what is it? What? How could that be? And then I looked at one of the people in that meeting, happened to be that guy who had told me, oh, his mom is Jamaican and all of that. And, you know, I felt like we were actually getting along. And although he was in a senior position to me, you know, I felt like we got along. And I had talked to him the day before and I was like, we spoke yesterday. Did you find that I seemed drunk? Did you find that I smelled of alcohol? Because, you know, you and I, we had some, a couple conversations yesterday. So... And I asked him that in the meeting, and I guess, I don't know if that made him uncomfortable or something, but he didn't stand up for me. And I said, you know, this is that this is entirely untrue. And they were like, oh, you know, this is not behavior that we tolerate, and we just need to make that clear to you, and blah, blah, blah. And I just could, I was just, and I was offended as well, because I felt like maybe they thought that this was something that I was capable of because I'm from the Caribbean. And maybe they think that all we do in the Caribbean is drink rum and party and have fun and we can't be serious about something. So I felt all, almost like it was also based on some kind of prejudice against me that they could even think this was possible without having any real indication of it because they could not have had any real indication of it because there was no reason for me to be smelling of alcohol and behaving intoxicated. So that was fabricated. Anyway, so the meeting ended and it was really awkward and I kind of went away but for the rest of the day obviously I couldn't feel normal. I just, I was stunned. I just didn't know where to put myself, what to do with myself. But obviously my mind was working and I was thinking to myself, who could legitimately claim to have smelled me? Who could claim beyond a doubt to know what was in my handbag? Who could see what was in my hand? And then I thought to myself, this, this girl who sits next to me, my mentor, Zoe, Chloe, Poppy, whatever her name is, she, obviously my handbag, my handbag would sit on the floor right between my chair and her chair. And I wouldn't like be too fussy about making sure it was closed or anything like that. So she would have seen what was in my handbag the day before without too much effort. And if she claimed to know how I smelled, she would be believed because she was in a position where she could be realistically smelling me all day and I guess the acting drunk I guess you know that's something that is so subjective if she said that I don't think anyone would necessarily question her and also remember she's the best manager in the business so she's someone who the organization trusted quite a bit so it occurred to me before the end of that day that she had sabotaged me and the only reason I could think of was because I had flagged her very first like complaint against her and it was just like I didn't even know how to react I don't know how you would react in this situation put yourself in my shoes like what do you do because you have at this point I had 
so much riding on this job. It was do this job or else be stuck in a job that I hated for three whole years. And when you're that young, three years feels like a lifetime in a job that you don't want, that you don't like. In the public service, when you're a conference interpreter and your whole life is about foreign languages, it's about traveling, it's about maybe trying to work for the United Nations or something like that. It was hard and I had all of that that was riding on this job. So this is even another reason why I would not be coming to work intoxicated. Anyway, so the next day I came in and I think I might have been about five minutes late or something like that. Um, and my heart wasn't in it so much anymore, but I was kind of trying to suck it up and tell myself, you know, this too shall pass and all of that. So I went in and as I walk in, everybody's gathering um, in like the common area and they are about to do this activity to start off the day where everybody sort of just kind of talks and people who are new introduce themselves and whatnot. And I think somehow somebody selected me to be one of the people to kind of talk about myself. But remember the day that I just had yesterday was like one of the worst days of my life th thus far. And I was just not in the best frame of mind. So I was asked to talk about myself a little bit. And I think I just like did the basics. Hi, my name is Jolene and I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. And I think that, you know, this is a great company. It's a great idea and I'm happy to have a position here. And I think it was something like that. And probably in that same tone of voice, you know, not super energetic or anything like that. Um, but I mean, if you know what happened the day before, you'd understand that. A lot of people listening might not, well, obviously they would not have known what had happened the day before, but the key people, the people in charge, they knew. So anyway, so that happened. And then we all were shuffling off to our various little offices and cubicles and all of that. And just before I entered the room where I was working alongside this girl, the same guy whose mom is Jamaican, or whatever, he comes up to me and he was like, um, we've made a decision that you do not suit our company, you're not a good fit. Yeah, we don't think that you are a good match for our organization and so we are going to end your, um, tr uh, not your training, I was still in my trial, probation, it was probation period, right? So we're going to end your probation now and um, you don't need to work out the rest of the week. Um, you can just leave. I suggest that you don't even bother to go in there, just go home. And, you know, we'll pay you for the whole month. And I felt like my whole life fell apart in that moment. I felt like, like the strong version of me, because everybody has that part of them that is strong, and that part of me wanted to be like, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, just for the sake of my own integrity, I'm gonna hold my head up high, and I am going to work out the rest of my month, and then I'm gonna leave, and you know, I wanted to do that, and I thought about it, but I was on the verge of tears, and I did not want, I'm not the kind of person who likes to cry in front of people, and I didn't want to cry in that office, and especially, no, I just didn't want, I just didn't want to have that display of emotion and vulnerability, uh, you know, in a place where people had just, first of all, just accused me after I'd been what, doing what I thought was a good job. I hadn't had any complaints against me and I was so new to the job. I hadn't really had much time to do anything right or wrong either way, you know, but I was passionate about it. I was excited about it. I had a lot riding on it and here they were just pulling the rug out from under me for no apparent reason. You know, unless it was because of this thing where they thought that I had come to work intoxicated. And I was just about to cry. I was just about to break down in tears. So I did pick up my bags. I went home and I had to tell all of my friends, my flatmates and everything. Everyone who I had basically just told them a few weeks before. Oh, I got a job and I'll be in England a little bit longer. Here I was telling them that I lost my job. And not just that I lost my job for anything that might be a good reason which there are kind of more dignified reasons to lose your job. No, they thought that I was a drunk and they kicked me out and said that I wasn't a good match. So yeah, that was, that was such a hard experience for me. It changed my life. In that moment, my life changed because I was not going to be able to make my first payment to the government for my scholarship. Remember, I had made this arrangement with them and oh my gosh, the roosters have started crowing. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, this is, you see what I mean? Background noise. I don't know if you can hear it, but there are roosters crowing because it's after 3 a.m. Anyway, I basically had to just pack my things and leave England as quickly as possible so that I could come back to Trinidad and take up that job that I never wanted to have, but that I did end up having to do for the government. And it, and it turned out to be an awful job. I mean, everything being fired was like the worst, like as low as I went. No, it was an awful job. I was working sometimes 24 hours straight, 26 hours straight, 28 hours straight with no sleep. I collapsed on the job. Like this job was more of a nightmare than I thought it was going to be. And that's it. I had to pick up my life, pack up my things and leave England. And that was in 2010. It was humiliating. It is humiliating. I don't talk about it for that reason, but I know that there are people who are out there going through this and thinking, how am I ever going to get back on my feet? after I have this kind of experience. And that's really why I wanted to share it because I absolutely did get back on my feet. I did not work in that horrible position for, for three years. Where there's a will, there's a way. And I managed to find a way to um, have those responsible for managing these scholars and all of that agree to let me work in my field because it was quite clear that what I was doing was not commensurate with my qualifications. And so I did not have to work in that job. I worked in that job for nine months. And then I started doing things that I am really much more interested in and that are related to languages and, you know, the things that I do. And so I actually got into my chosen career a lot faster than I might have if I had stayed in that job. That was kind of going to, it was probably going to be a massive distraction for me. And then, um, interestingly enough, um, while I was in Trinidad, I came, like I said, at the very end of 2010, I came to Trinidad. And in 2011, uh, an English guy who I had never met in England came to Trinidad and he came to work. And we met a while after and we became friends and then we got involved in a romantic relationship and now we're married. So I met my husband who is English in Trinidad. I would not have been here if that job had gone well. And you know what? I don't think that there is anything in this world that I would trade for the life that I have now, for the relationship that I have now. It's not perfect. I am going through something really difficult right now that I'm not ready to divulge yet. But so much good has happened to me since I've come back to Trinidad. And I, like I said, I would have never met my husband if I hadn't come back which is crazy because I lived in England, he lived in England, we never met there. We both met in Trinidad, that is just life for you. It can surprise you in the craziest ways. So if you're going through something right now where you feel like the world is coming to an end and it's a horrible thing, losing a job for, for a reason that is just unfair and false and wrong and, and there's nothing you can do, but there is nothing you can do about it. It's crazy. You feel powerless and you feel like you try so hard to make things work in a certain way and you're not asking for much and life just comes and dumps all over you. And I know that feeling. And if you're going through that right now, remember there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I am here to tell you that there is a sunny side. That, like I said, that experience, I had it in 2010. That was six years ago. My life is so crazy. It's like so different from what I thought it would be, and I could not have planned it this well. I've heard it said that joy can only fill you as deeply as sorrow has carved you, and I really think that that is true. Sometimes we are going to go through hard times. That is what life is like, and it hurts, and it sucks. Like my mother says, you're not a dolly. You, you have feelings, and so, you know, you're going to hurt, and it Things are going to happen in life that are just going to be massively unfair, but don't worry, there are also going to be amazing things that are going to come in your future. And one day, the sadness that you're going through, it's just going to be a memory. So that was really my message. I wasn't like here to, it wasn't really meant to be a rant or something sad. You know, I didn't, I managed to tell the story and I did get emotional at points, but you'll notice I didn't cry or anything because it's, it's a story. Everything in life, one day it just becomes a story to tell. So yeah, that was my story time. I hope you've enjoyed it. Check out the other videos on my channel if you haven't seen any of them yet. Maybe you'll like my channel and subscribe if you haven't already. For those of you who have already subscribed, I want to say thank you so much. I really appreciate it and I make my videos with you in mind. So yeah, let me 
go to bed because like I said it's after 3 in the morning and this is crazy. This is how much I love you guys. This is how much I love you guys. So yeah, bye and I will see you guys in